We've been using the same battery technology for 30 years now, and our lives depend on it. Your phone, laptop, car, smoke detectors, medical equipment, and so much more. But what if I told you that a deceptively simple, but previously out of reach technology is about to change your life forever? And that's no exaggeration. By the end of this video, you'll discover why we can't continue to use our current batteries for much longer and the unbelievable replacement that will change the way you live your life. And I'm not just talking about prolonged battery life for your phone. What this new technology will unlock is so, so much more than that. The future of battery technology is much closer than you think, and the outcome might just surprise us all. Let me tell you why. But first, I want to ask you a question. Why is this regular old clay pot from about 0 AD one of the most important discoveries in human history? To answer that, we need to travel back to 1936. When this berry pot was dug up, along with a bunch of other similar artifacts, in a small village near Baghdad, Iraq, this particular pot, which is believed to be about 2,000 years old, sat in a museum for two years. Just a dusty, not all that remarkable exhibit amongst many others. Also, that's what everyone thought, except for one man. When Austrian archaeologist Wilhelm Kigg first viewed this vessel, he suspected there was something exceptional about it that everyone else had missed. And he was right. It turns out this 2,000-year-old clay pot is the first known example of a battery built by humans, now known as the Baghdad battery. It's a fairly unremarkable thing. It's just a clay pot plugged up with a stopper made of asphalt. Sticking through that asphalt is an iron rod which is surrounded by a copper coil. And there was also an acidic residue inside of it, suggesting it had once been filled with grape juice. The grape juice inside the pot was acidic enough to react with the copper and iron electrodes, which would have created a small electric current. It only produced a measly 1V, not enough to power lights or to keep people's 2,000-year-old iPhones charged. But the Baghdad battery was never built for any of that. It was probably made to electroplate small objects with a thin layer of copper for decoration. But the principle behind this archaic invention has remained exactly the same ever since. And that very same principle now powers. If we boil it down, actually, don't ever boil batteries. That's a spectacularly stupid idea. A battery consists of a cathode, the positive electrode, an anode, the negative electrode, and an electrolyte that allows ions to move between them. Usually a liquid, gel, or paste. In the Baghdad battery, the cathode was the copper cylinder, the anode was the iron rod, and the electrolyte was the grape juice. So you see, nothing has changed. The lithium-ion battery in your laptop has a cathode, lithium metal oxide, an anode, usually graphite, and the electrolyte is a lithium salt solution. Sure, we've made plenty of refinements over the years, but the fundamental principles are almost two millennia old. Modern batteries, however, didn't arrive until 1800 when Italian scientist Alessandro Volta stacked alternating zinc and copper disks, separated by pieces of cardboard soaked in brine, to create a voltaic pile. This was the world's first continuous electrical battery. When Volta connected wires to the top and bottom of his pile, a steady flow of electricity was produced. The next major breakthrough came in 1859, when French physicist Gaston Planté built the world's first rechargeable battery, the lead acid cell. Then in 1899, Swedish scientist Allur Junger built the first nickel-cadmium battery. And it was another 70 years before we saw the next big step forward the lithium battery. It's hard to overstate just how game-changing the lithium battery was in the 1970s when it was invented by Michael Whittingham and patented by ExxonMobil. It was the first battery that was both rechargeable and capable of delivering a high voltage. It made all the futuristic portable tech that we now use possible, and it's still the foundation of most modern batteries. John B. Goodenough later expanded on Whittingham's research to double the capacity of lithium batteries. Speaking of which, the lithium battery is pretty good, but it's just not good enough. Sure, 
We can make even bigger lithium batteries, but there's a scientific limit on how much energy can be stored within a given weight of the host battery, and that number is 260 WH per kilogram. It's pretty decent considering older battery technology sat around 75. The latest iPhone 16 Pro is pretty bloody good. It lasts about a day and a bit on its 12.7 WH battery. But if Apple wanted the next iPhone to last for one week, they'd have to put a five times heavier battery in it. I can see it now, introducing the iPhone 16 Pro Supermax, the fattest, most powerful iPhone we've ever built. But there's a second sort of secret, big, invisible barrier to making bigger, better batteries. That big tech doesn't like to bother your big brain about, but it's a big problem. Sorry, I got a bit carried away there. We're running out of raw materials to make the damn things. According to a really intelligent scientist that I interviewed, to make a lithium battery, you need lithium. And to make a nickel-cadmium battery, you need nickel and cadmium. And to make a lead-acid battery, you need lead and acid. I think you can see where I'm going with this. The problem is, none of these materials grow on trees in a magical battery orchard. They're all really hard to come by and require dangerous, energy-hungry, environmentally shitty mining processes, usually carried out by child slaves in unsanitary, unhealthy conditions. And that's a big problem, because if we're going to build a battery revolution, we're going to need a lot more of these rare earth minerals, and our current system just isn't sustainable. Or, well, good, the two primary goals of all new theoretical batteries are increasing energy density and decreasing charging times. And there are a few really exciting new battery technologies that could change everything. I'll tell you about those in just a minute. But first, you've probably already heard of one of them, the battery industry's poster child. I'm talking about solid-state batteries. Unlike traditional batteries, which use a liquid or gel electrolyte, solid-state batteries use a solid one. Yeah, I know. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you expecting laser batteries made from the tears of alien hamsters? It's a minor change, but it's hard to understate just how revolutionary this tweak will be. The most promising prototype use a ceramic electrolyte. It's the perfect choice really, since it's highly conductive, allowing ions to easily pass through it. But the biggest improvement will actually be in safety. Current batteries have two fatal flaws. Firstly, they are susceptible to thermal runaway, leading to fires, explosions, and bad times. Secondly, lithium-based batteries can form dendrites. These are strands of lithium metal that grow inside the electrolyte over time. If a dendrite grows so large that it breaches the gap between the cathode and anode, it can short-circuit, leading to fires, explosions, and bad times. Solid-state batteries eliminate both of these concerns. Ceramic is chemically inert and extremely stable under high temperatures, so thermal runaway is no longer an issue. And being solid, dendrites will have a tough time penetrating the electrolyte. Solid-state batteries promise energy densities of around 100% more than lithium, primarily because there's no permanent anode in solid-state batteries, reducing the weight by almost 50%. Just think about what that means. An EV vehicle that has a 350-mile range today with the exact same weight would have a 700-mile range. That would basically eliminate the whole range anxiety argument against electric cars. For those of you who've never driven an EV, that's the concern. You'll be stranded 100 miles from the nearest charger because your manufacturer lied to you. And then you have to fit all your passengers in a car that's not moving. American company QuantumScape is currently leading the charge in solid-state battery development, but more refinement is needed to make them stable and operate consistently. It's currently estimated that we'll see solid-state batteries inside cars and consumer tech by 2025. But what if there was a simpler solution to better batteries? What if we could just take lithium-ion batteries and replace one of its primary minerals, cobalt, with a cheaper, more abundant, and more effective alternative? There are 118 known elements. Surely one of them can provide the answer without fire, explosions, and bad times. Well, it turns out sulfur might do just that. At least, that's the aim of lithium sulfur batteries. What makes these such a game changer is their energy density. Sulfur, the cathode material, is both lightweight and capable of hosting much more lithium ions. For comparison, prototype sulfur batteries have demonstrated 550 WH kg of energy density compared to the 260 WH kg of current lithium batteries. And it's likely that that 550 figure will be increased with further research. Sulfur is also abundant 
and very low cost. In fact, it's the tenth most abundant element in the universe by mass, whereas cobalt and nickel used in lithium-ion batteries are both considerably rarer and more difficult to extract. Oh, and did I mention that there are countless labs that have already built working, commercially viable sulfur batteries right now? In fact, we've been working on this concept since the 60s and our current iterations are pretty far advanced. So, what gives? Why aren't our laptops, phones, and cars half the weight with twice the energy? Well, commercially viable is a loose term. The current versions suffer from very low lifespans during charge and discharge cycles. The sulfur cathode tends to dissolve, which leads to rapid decay in battery performance over time. Another challenge is the shuttle effect, where polysulfide molecules shuttle between the cathode and anode, degrading the battery's performance. Some prototypes have only demonstrated in the range of 10 to 30 charging cycles before giving up entirely. And nobody's going to buy an EV that can be charged 30 times, even if it does have a 1,000 mile range. However, rapid improvements are now being made to reduce these drawbacks. And in the past year, there have been some lithium sulfur batteries produced that have lifespans in the hundreds of cycles instead of just 30. Tens. By the way, the general consensus is that the target for a battery that is properly commercially viable is 2,000 cycles. The most prominent name in the space is Lion, a venture capital-funded startup that's building an automated production line in San Jose, California specifically for producing lithium sulfur batteries. With EV manufacturers as their primary buyers, they expect to start shipping in 2024. If that holds true, it would be extremely exciting and the start of a portable energy revolution. And yes, I give you permission to return to this comment section in a year's time to ask me where the hell all those damn sulfur batteries actually are. And that's the big question, isn't it? When if ever, Will we see these technologies in the real world, in our homes and workplaces? There are quite a few other promising battery technologies on the horizon, such as sodium ion, graphene, and even quantum batteries. But like nuclear fusion, they all seem to be just around the corner. Let's just hope that corner isn't actually a bloody circle and that it actually has an end. But just like nuclear fusion, a new battery technology is a very high stakes reward. We've been using the same batteries for well over 30 years now and a cheaper, lighter, more energy-dense alternative is proving to be extremely elusive. But if we do crack that nut, it's no exaggeration to say that the world will change forever. There are the obvious changes, like electric vehicles with more than double the range and 5-10 to 10 minute charging times, laptops, phones, and wearables that last for days instead of just one. And we'll see massive improvements to the stability and efficiency of the power grid with better load balancing to prevent power cuts and more efficient usage of renewable energy. But then, there are quite a few changes that could come from better batteries that will turn our world upside down, and they might not be immediately apparent to you. Let me explain. What if we develop batteries that are so energy dense, so cheap, and so efficient that a remote village could obtain one? charge it using solar, and the entire village could then enjoy a steady, uninterrupted supply of close to free electricity forever. Obviously, solar would need to become more efficient too, but that's happening in parallel with better battery tech. For reference, current solar tech is about 20% efficient, but recent prototypes have pushed that up to 40%. Okay, now imagine every community in the world does the same thing generating and storing most, if not all, of their energy needs. Suddenly, you're looking at a decentralized energy network. Communities that generate and store more electricity than they use could sell it back into the grid for a profit and use that money to improve their community. This would also ease the stranglehold that big energy has on our power bills. A power grid built by the people for the people could mean that citizens of every nation might enjoy cheaper, cleaner electricity forever. That might all sound a bit far-fetched and utopian, and I realize that things don't always pan out in the most ideal way. But just think for a moment about how much political controversy, warfare, and general shittery is caused by the global power struggle between ideologically diverse governments and the big gas, oil, and electricity companies. Don't worry, I'm not turning into a hippie. I'm just saying that if we can all generate a little bit of our own electricity, just like some people grow some of their own food and get the rest from the supermarket, it would reduce the demand and strain on continent-spanning energy grids that are messy and 
all too often a bit bloody troublesome. What if you didn't have to worry about the next power cut because you knew that you were in control of your own power supply? For most people, the cost and size of the batteries required for a single household's needs are the biggest barriers right now to this ideal scenario. But if we can make those batteries significantly cheaper, lighter, and more energy dense, we might just find that we're all energized with a little spark of hope. Thanks for watching.